direct from the web, it's Billy Masters Live. And now, please welcome your host, Billy Masters. Hey everyone, welcome to Billy Masters Live. Oh, we're having some sort of a computer issue over here. Okay, already computer issues. Welcome to Billy Masters Live. Of course, I am your host, Billy Masters, and today is, somebody better put it up on the screen, because I never know what day it is. There it is, Thursday, August 20th, 2020. We were gabbing backstage. Um, this is going to be such a fun show. I cannot even tell you how much fun this is going to be. Um, we've been we, you know, if you tuned into Tuesday's show, the Naked Boy Singing Reunion and uh, Origin of the show, we were we have been having some technical issues here in Boston. I don't know why, but things have been freezing up, and I cur currently have three computers around me. So if things go wrong, I can just click on another computer and hopefully still communicate with you, even though I won't look as good. See now on the other camera. Look at this. <gasps> look at that. I'm on another camera. But if I look over there, then I look over here. Oh, it's just so technologically insane. Um, Next week's shows. Let me just tell you guys, next week's shows are going to be kind of amazing. We've got on Tuesday, we've got author Christopher Rice and Rice's little boy is going to be here. And Thursday, we're continuing reunion here on Billy Masters Live. And we will have Naked Boys singing. I'm uh, not Naked Boys singing. Oh, my God. See, I got Naked Boys on the mind. Uh, no, we've got Funny Gay Males. And we've talked about Bob Smith before on this show, who has passed away, founding member of... Um, uh, the troop, but we will have Danny McWilliams, Jaffe Cohen, and oh my God, suddenly his name has gone out of my head. I'm old. All right. Anyway, but we're going to have funny gay males here and um, that will be great. And I have to, you usually I will open with an anecdote, but we've got such a big show. I can't, but I have to tell this. Um, a fan, somebody watching this show, Kim, if Kim is watching, let me just uh, say hello, Kim. Um, Kim had wanted to send me something in the mail and uh, said she or he, I don't really know, it could be a male Kim, um, wanted my address to send me something. And I just got in the mail today two Lindsay Wagner DVDs. I've got Lindsay Wagner and um, Peter Fonda in Two People, which I have seen, but I don't think I had on DVD. And then a, a big rarity, Lindsay Wagner, Another Side of Me, she sang. You might have seen the Bionic Woman episode where she sang Feelings during a beauty pageant. This is a whole singing, like she had a special on like, some network. Anyway, I've never had these before. You know I love my Lindsay Wagner, so thank you, Kim, for sending these. I appreciate it. I cannot wait to watch them. Um, you will also notice this shirt. If you go on Facebook, you will see I wear this shirt an inordinate amount of times. And it's one of my favorite t-shirts. I wear it to my favorite events. I can throw a jacket over it. I can wear it without a jacket. There's a little cleavage. There's a lot going on. I have not worn this show on 42, this shirt on 42 shows. So uh, that's how you know it's a special show. If you see this shirt again, it's a special show. Um, I just found out backstage, and I had uh, expected this, but I sort of really just figured it out, that our big guests for this show have never met, or at least I don't think they've ever met. They just said, nice to meet you, so I'm thinking they never met. Um, up first, you know, this hairspray is the gift that keeps on giving. Uh, Mark Shaman, one of my dearest friends, he, he and his partner, Scott Whitman, wrote this show, and... I can say that certainly the original cast all became really good friends, but so many people who've come through this show have been extraordinary people and people I love. And uh, our first guest is one of those people. She was the Tracy in the film version. See, now look, there we got an animated gif of her or gif, you know, my niece will scream at me. Um, every time I see her, 
I smile. At the premiere of Hairspray, the film premiere of Hairspray, I fell in love with Nikki Blonsky. And every time I see her, somehow, and don't ask me why, somehow we always end up dancing. Everywhere I see her, we're dancing. She is the most fun. She's got one of the best personalities in the world. She's so talented. She's a great actress, a great singer, and now an official part of our community. So please welcome Nikki Blonsky. Hi, hon. Hello. How are you? I'm so good. I'm so glad. You know, you have a smile that just lights up a room. And when I first saw you in the movie, which I hadn't met you at the time, I said, oh, you know, she's just a really good actress and she gives that off. But you give it off in real life. Is it just who you are? Honestly, Billy, I can tell you, I wake up every day, and we all know this, life's crazy. You never know what's going to happen from day to day in Nikki land. I never know what's going to go down, but I make a conscious decision every day to smile and to be happy. I'm not, I'm just not going to let others, you know, take me down. I have too many smiles to give. I have too much fun in life. And you really do. I mean, um, and, and, and also, anytime I see you someplace, you seem to really... I don't know if it's making an effort or if it's just you. You always seem to be having a good time. Is that a conscious choice or is that just who you are? I think it's very much who I am. Like, I just really enjoy life and I enjoy all of the, you know, the ups and the downs because it, the downs make the ups that much greater. Um, but I do make a decision to to really just, like, enjoy moments. And I think as I'm getting older, I'm really <laughs> in the moment more. And older being how old? 30. I'll be 32 in November. You were so young. <laughs> I was so young when I did a hairspray. Yeah, but, uh, let's, let's talk about that because that is such an amazing story. Um, tell people how you were discovered. So I had seen the Broadway show when I was 15. Uh, oh, my God. Broadway. Mark Shaman and Scott Whitman so brilliantly wrote, and I was in love immediately. That was it. I heard, oh, 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 and that was it. I was in, signed, sealed, delivered. I was done for. I needed to play Tracy Turnblad. Um, and then I saw that they, I had always gotten Backstage Magazine, which mm -hmm. is like, you know, the, the magazine for actors. I would go to the train station every week and pick it up. And I picked it up and it said that they were uh, having open call auditions for the Broadway musical. And I went and I did about, I think it was three callbacks uh, with Bernard Telsey's office. And that mm -hmm. was just the thrill to be able to audition, um, you know, in Telsey was just as an actor, that was just wild in itself. Was that your um, biggest audition at that point? It was my only audition. <laughs> 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 you just said I'm gonna go do it. Did you have pictures or anything? Uh, no, I I think <laughs> I had, I had taken some headshots with a friend of mine, and we printed them up. I think at CVS. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Uh, CVS is still my favorite store. But so I'll never forget. I went through like three callbacks, and they finally told me I was too young for to play her on Broadway. And I was like, but she's 16 and I'm 16. And uh, do you remember who, do you remember who, who got the role at that point? I don't, I don't, I know it was, it was already, it had already been on Broadway for a few years. So oh, was, okay, yeah. And then I remember on my 17th birthday, I said, well, I'm just relentless. So I'm just going to go audition again. And I went to check on the Broadway show's website to see when they were, you know, having auditions again. And it said, we're casting the movie. And I was like, ah, oh. so I scrolled down to the ages and it said ages 17 to 24. And, and you I just like, turned 17. That like literally that morning. So I was like, oh, this is it. I have to send in a tape. It said, don't send in any tapes. I sent it. <laughs> um, and I started a six month audition process. And here we are almost 14 years later, 13 years old. Oh, what what do you remember about that opening? Was that opening night? Was that the first time you had seen it or had you screened it before then? I saw, I saw it twice before that. Um, but it was weird. The first time I saw it, it was not 
really in a natural environment either. It was like in a small screening room, but it was with my mom and Adam Shankman, our director. But then mm -hmm. Adam Sandler was there and I was like, okay, so I'm not just like really watching the movie, just, you know, with friends and watching it with Adam Sandler, um, <laughs> who I've idolized like my entire life. So it was, it was really, really cool. And I sat there with Adam Shankman and my mom and I held both of their hands and I just cried. <laughs> That night, I, I remember that night, and I remember just you dancing and having so much fun that night. Um, it, it That also, because I, I having known Mark and Scott for so long, it was really like an emotional night for all of us. But for you being young and having this history with the show, to be at the opening night party of a, sh of a movie that you are the star of, I can't even imagine. Billy, it still doesn't feel real. Like this many years later, I, there has to be at least at least three to five times a day where I have to like say to myself, "Do you is is this really happening? Are you okay? Should you sit down? Because it just <laughs> sounds too crazy." But I guess it is real. And yeah. I'm very I'm very thankful. Hairspray has been like you said, it's the gift that keeps on giving. It's been the greatest blessing of my entire life, and. And I'm just, I'm very thankful for it each and every day. I'm wondering, is there a, is there a downside to doing something so high profile as your first real job and leading it? Because we, is everything else after that almost like a letdown or do you have to look for the excitement in smaller roles? No, I think with me, it's about finding the excitement in each role, what makes it different. Um, uh -huh. You know, for me, that that thrill of playing Tracy, that the dream of just getting to portray her, that's all I ever wanted. But I think as I've gone on and, and after playing her, I found that my dream is really just to play characters that mean something. Mm -hmm. Not just to me, but to the audience um, and to kids. And so I think with each role that I play, whether it be Tracy or whether it be, you know, another movie or a sitcom, I think with me, it's all about the character and the heart of the character. And as long as I do that and play characters with, you know, big hearts and, and great personalities. I don't think there could ever be a letdown, but you are right. Tracy is like the all time, <laughs> like blast of blasts to play. So it's kind of like, she's like King Daka, like, you know, mm -hmm. at, the, <laughs> at, uh, <laughs> at Six Flags, but everything else is a really fun ride too. So I'm just, <laughs> you know. Having been, you know, a live singer, because uh, obviously I have heard you sing live and you wanted to do it live on stage, was it different than you expected having to either lip sync or scale down a performance for the film? What was really cool with the film was we, a lot of the live performances, you know, we went in and we recorded the entire soundtrack, obviously, but we were doing it as we were making the movie. So that was my first time in a recording studio. And I remember, yeah. Um, when I walked into the recording studio in LA, we were recording, I can hear the bells, I think. And mama, I'm a big girl now at Capitol records. And I walked down one of the hallways and it said there was a plaque outside the room of Judy Garland. And it said, this is where Judy Garland recorded somewhere of the rainbow. And I was oh, like, wow. Oh my gosh. I mean, and it just gave me as a singer, gave me such a chance to be in a recording studio with people like Mark Shaman and Scott Whitman and, and all of these brilliant artists. And it was the most beautiful eye opening experience. And then to get to sing those songs that I had been such a fan of. Yeah. I sat there word for word during the Broadway show and sang my heart out with them now getting to sing them and uh, take my take on them was really, really cool. And just to be there supported by Mark and Scott, it was Literally a dream come true. Was there still a dream after you did the movie that you still wanted to do it live? Or or did you say, okay, I got the movie. I'm done with this role. I think part of me will always wonder what it would be like to play Tracy live. Um, but the other part of me is really, really happy that <laughs> she's right there. My interpretation of her is right there for all eternity. Um 
but I think part of me will always wonder because it's that, you know, that thespian in me, that performer that loves to get out there and sing these songs live. But I do get to sing them live and I include them in my one woman shows and when I perform. So I always take Tracy and Harrisburg with me wherever I go. Yeah, it seems to me, and I I would think um, Marissa's the same way. It's like she got to do the stage version, yeah. and by the time the film came film came around, she was older, and it's like it's time to pass that torch to somebody else. But she had that. Yeah, I think all of our experiences, Ricky, Marissa, and I, and now Maddie, we yeah. had. Um, we've gotten to experience Tracy in different ways from each other, but there's that beautiful bond of her that brings us all together at the end of the day, which is really cool. So Tracy yeah. is just good very much. Yeah. I love that theory because I've seen you guys all together. Certainly at that opening night, we were all together. And I know that when you've seen each other, it's like this little sisterhood of the traveling Tracy's. It is. I love that. And can I just tell you that Every time I see Ricky Lake, I'm still stunned and shocked that I get to be in the same room as her. Because I'm <laughs> still just the biggest Ricky Lake fan. I don't think that's the one thing that will never go away. Is just that I get to be friends with somebody that I've idolized my entire life. And now to get to like know her for the beautiful heart that she is, yeah. I'm a bigger fan now. Were you a fan of the original movie? Yeah. You know, before the musical? Yeah, I was a big fan of the original movie. Um, of course, Divine and Ricky and Jerry Stiller, they stole my heart. So Yeah. But you, you've you gone on to do other things, too. And what I love about you is that you're kind of open to everything. You do live performances. You've done television. Um, you seem to me, and it's funny because I first saw you in a film, and yet you seem to me to be really a live kind of person, whether it's television in front of a live audience yeah. or live in a theater. Is that sort of like where your heart lives? Is that you want that response from an audience? Or is it, again, different things? I think it's the performing for people, whether it's taped or, you know, even like I do my podcast and even though I know that like there's no audience there, I can actually like envision people who I know, like my friends who are going to be listening to the podcast. So I go into every performance with like the notion that there's already people in the room, even if mm -hmm. it's an empty room. Um, right. I do enjoy a live audience, but I really do love film and television. There's something about movie making that I find absolutely magical and like nothing else in the world. Um, so, but I do, I do like to try all different things. Like one thing that nobody knows is like my ultimate dream is to like do a night of, you know, all different music, cover opera, some Sondheim and do it at like Lincoln center or the Met. Like that's. Oh, my, sure. Why not? I mean, I just love to try different things and, you know, see what happens. Where do you get this incredible confidence? Because, I mean, I, I don't remember I don't remember at the opening night party meeting parents. Did the, your parents instill this in you? Where did that come from? Uh, they did. I also, you know, I credit my grandmother for a lot of it. She oh, yeah. was one who at a very young age when I started to get bullied for my weight and everything, she was the one who made sense of everything. She was the one who told me people make fun of you because they're insecure with themselves. And, you know, she was the one who told me you have to follow your heart and your dreams. And so, yes, I did have a very supportive family, but I also, it just never made sense in my mind to be anything but myself, if that makes sense. Like I just have too much, Ooh fun being me but at the same time um you know I do have insecurities but I'm not going to, they're not great enough to halt um you know what I want to do in this business and what I want to achieve there's you so seem fearless <laughs> I I I don't know. There is a part of me that is fearless because what's the worst that can happen? Like we're all going to die someday. That's <laughs> uh, you know, what's next? There's a pandemic going on, you know, like there's, there, there are horrible things out there. So just live each day to the fullest and take every shot, you know?
What was it like doing, um, appearing with Lisa Lampanelli off Broadway? Because that to me seems like it must have been shot again, shot out of a cannon. Yeah. Well, that's a good way of putting it. Um, <laughs> yeah, it was. It was very different from my other off Broadway experience that I had in that exact theater. Um, oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, my first off Broadway experience was Love Loss and What I Wore. Oh, and sure. I got to perform with Anita Gillette and Pauletta Washington and Judy Gold and Alexis Bledel. And every night getting out there was such a charge. This live audience and just hearing the laughter and seeing people be moved by telling these stories. Um, and I went from having like, like the most thrilling experience to a different experience. But I think that's the thing with this business is you have to like take every experience and learn from them. And I learned and um, yeah. <laughs> I, learned. Um, I learned that I'm, I'm more of a tough cookie than I, I thought. And I think I also learned that there are things that I'm willing to say and there are things that I'm just not willing to say on stage to, you know, I think it's one thing to build a community like the plus size community up, but then to like make jokes, you know, on their behalf. It's just, I don't know. I, I'm not one to, uh, to be a proponent of that. I'm all about lifting people up. So, yeah, you know, that's kind of my experience, but I learn from everything and I take everything with a grain of salt and I move forward. You know, we had talked, um, it was, I guess, beginning of June about you being on the show. And at the time, I had made a decision that I was only going to have out uh, openly gay performers on the show. And I just didn't yeah. talk to you. Well, I didn't talk to you about it. I mean, I, I kind of had an idea, but we had never talked about it. Yeah. And I had said to your manager, I said, you know, let's circle back in July. Well, like the day before I'm about to email her, all of a sudden, this video shows up on screen and I'm looking at you. I'm not, I muted the music out because we don't need copyright issues. Right. But I'm like, first off, I, I am again saying, wait a minute. First off, look how fabulous you are. I mean, just such a fabulous free spirit in this field. Where are you? Okay. So I'm literally in my, my friend Patty's backyard on Long Island. <laughs> uh, my dear friend Patty, Patty, we love you. Um, my publicist Diana filmed this. Uh, oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, she filmed it at her husband's socially distant surprise party. There was like <laughs> six of us in a backyard on Long Island. And and she said to me, hey, what about TikTok? And I'm a big TikToker. And so we made a TikTok and we posted it. And then I was getting a lot of, um, is this real? Is the no? Are you joking? And I'm like, so we just decided to make a graphic that literally could not be misinterpreted right. and put it up. I mean, there's no questioning that. So, I mean, I've never been one for small statements anyways. But what made you decide that this was the time? You know, I think honestly with the pandemic, I've had so much time for self-reflection. I know that we all have, but as I found myself writing my book and really talking about everything that has been going on in my life, I felt like now more time than ever was a time to really just be myself and to be authentic. And I've always told people, you know, every fan and every supporter of mine to live your truth and be yourself. And mm -hmm. I was just ready to join my own party, you know? <laughs> And also, again, you did the way you did. You're so free and so happy, and I think that also magnifies. Then, if you just gave a statement, this is actually like it's a. I watched it, and I said that's like a living embodiment of coming out. When I came out, I'll tell you exactly when I when I came out that night. I had the most free experience of my life. It was raining, and I had come out on my friend Alec Mappa's show, and then we made the TikTok, and it all went up. And I'll never forget that night. I was so happy that I went outside. It was raining. I didn't care. I put on Fergie and I danced <laughs> to the bridge. The whole song. I just went haywire. And it was it was really beautiful. My friends didn't believe me. And I was like, oh no, no, no. There's an entire choreographed video. Don't, <laughs> don't try me, my friends. Um, 
But I think for me, uh, performing is always the best way to get things out and to get um, my feelings out or however, whatever my point I'm trying to get across. And it just felt right that this a way to do it was sing and dance my way out. <laughs> I just thought it was so wonderful. And again, it also shows so much of your personality and your, um, you know, your enthusiasm. What I love is that it's been how many years since Hairspray, and yet you are still that girl that I met so many years ago, dancing on the dance. I mean, as I've said, anytime I've bumped into you someplace, you are so excited and exuberant. And I have met people along their career that lose that, and you haven't lost that. And I think that it's so important. Well, because I honestly, I truly find life exciting, you know, yeah. and I find this business exciting. Um, you know, it's up and down, it's all around, but I've just found a way to um, rock with it and enjoy it. And what's there not to be excited about, you know? Yeah. Is there a dream role? It, like if I said to you in the next five years, what would be your dream role? There is. There is a dream role. Um, there's some projects that I'm personally working on that I've started developing for myself uh, with friends of mine. Um, so there are some dream roles, but there's also I would love to just create some new roles. Mm -hmm. And really, I would love to see. You know, I was just on my podcast, I was talking to uh, a friend of mine, Yuriko O'Hara, who's a brilliant drag queen. And I said, I really think that it's time that Disney has a plus size princess. You know, I would love yeah. to see it. You know, so I think um, for me, I would just love to originate some great roles. I would also love to, if there were other, you know, roles that needed to be recreated, that would be fun too. But I think for me, it's all about just finding new characters and part of really great storylines. I mean, it's great that you had hairspray, that you had that single mindedness to say, I want to do this and you made it happen. I have no doubt that you are going to make anything you want to happen, happen. Nothing is going to stop you. Thank you. Well, uh, I, just, I just go full force. <laughs> See, now, just when you said that, one of those stray hairs went into my eye. And I'm like, we, Nikki and I were talking before here. We're talking and we're fixing our hair. So uh, the hair is very important, Nikki. It's so important. It's <laughs> for, my hair is forever, you know, doing something. <laughs> Nikki, I'm going to put you backstage, but we're going to be back with you in a few minutes. Okay, sounds good. Thanks, honey. Um, oh, well, from that to... Um, somebody who, you know, it's so funny that when I first met Garrett Clayton, it was at a friend's party, if I'm not mistaken. And I, uh, I didn't know who he was at the time. And then like within a few short months, I got to know him and in many, many, many different roles and saw how talented he was, whether it was on film, whether it was on stage, whether it was singing or just acting. He is, of course, the link from the television version of Hairspray. And I am thrilled to have him here, Mr. Garrett Clayton. Hold on a second. Where are you? There you are. Hi. Hey, Garrett. How are you? Good. How are you? I'm good. Look, you're here so good, too. Well, oh, thank you. I'm trying to figure out this light. I'm, I'm trying to do all this stuff from home now, and it's not going very well. <laughs> no, it's, it's fabulous. It's uh, it, it it's it's so weird that we have to now learn all this new these new skill sets that we never had before because totally. it's all we've got. Um, you know, with you, I want to actually start with talking about um, your YouTube channel because your YouTube channel. Oh, and by the way, there's the Motormouth Mabel who is backstage. We yeah. don't see you on the camera. So fix your camera. You got 20 minutes. Okay. <laughs> um, but anyway, you've been doing this. Um, is it a podcast? I guess it's a podcast, but it's your own YouTube channel um, with your fiance, Blake. And I just want to show the very beginning of it and then let's talk about it. Hold on a second.
Hello, I'm Garrett Clayton. And I'm Blake Knight. And welcome to A, A Gay, Gay in, in the Life. Life. Where we explore the lived experiences of LGBTQ plus people from all around the world. Our hope is that we can raise awareness for different issues and changes going on in the world. And that way we can affect a global change as a community. When I was younger and growing up in Texas, there weren't really very many resources available to me as a person who was trying to come to terms with their sexuality. I know that when I was younger, I didn't necessarily have the same resources that people have today through the internet. That's right. So we're hoping that we can utilize the internet to give other young people resources. I think that's so great, Garrett. Um, when did you start it? Why did you start it? I mean, I know why you just said why you started, but I mean, for you, what got you to say, you know, let's just do this? So um, we, uh, a couple friend of ours reached out and they have a channel and then they were telling us YouTube is interested in working with us. And then, you know, there's so much about social media and the internet that's just about itself. And, uh, and I, I, I recognize those things, especially with Instagram or TikTok or Twitter. It's always, it feels um, a, a bit more vapid than right. uh, than it, than necessary. And so we wanted to create something that can put some good into the world. And this felt right, just because American media is so insular and so about itself and realizing that there's resources in the world and we would like to I want to use my platform to be one of them. And also in this time where, you know, I'm, I'm realizing as a white man with privilege that there's um, a lot of responsibility that comes with being not just in the public eye or being on a platform, but having, having that privilege is uh, a, not that I've asked for it, but a responsibility to do something good with it. So I, if I can help amplify other people's uh, stories or voices or concerns that they're trying to bring awareness to, then hopefully I can, you know, find a, a way to be a better ally and ask questions. Because I'm sure there's a lot of people who want to be better allies in the world and want to know how to help without it just being a social media post and making right. it the optical um performance of it, you know, and like really finding ways to do the work. And so I figure I'm not always going to ask the right questions, but I'd rather ask them. And then if it saves someone else, the the struggle of not knowing how to go about it. And if I can, basically, if I can do some good with this and with this position and with this platform, no matter the size of it, if it can affect one person and make their day better or make their life a little easier then then I'm happy to do it. And so, oh, yeah. Yeah, we're really lucky. We've already gotten some really incredible people um, and artists and guests. And we're really, our goal is to not just interview at least one person from every country in the world, but um, from each region within those countries. Because, mm -hmm. I mean, if you think about America and how, how not just divided politics wise, but how divided between our, uh, the sections of our, our race and our races and our, our traditions and trying to learn how, how all, everyone works and try and support and love and spread the joy within um, how unique and different we are and how to su best support it um, is really, I think, the next step. Yeah, I think that we have to realize that there is no blueprint for any of this that everyone's got their own journey and as you said yeah. every I, I remember when i started writing my column um which was syndicated at a point where there wasn't even the internet as much mm -hmm. as it is now and somebody in like the midwest would pick up a gay paper or stumble upon it and realize that there was a whole world outside of where they lived and now with the with the internet what you're doing i think you're really developing a community forum yeah, that's the hope. And also, you know, what's interesting, and it's funny that you asked about a podcast, a lot of people have asked because what they don't realize is in our episodes, mind you, the, the response we're getting is already so wonderful. And thank you to anyone who follows the channel and is watching right now. But um, we, we also realize that there's because there's so many traditions within the straight uh, community, that we don't really have, we don't have those things because we're just we're we're just feeling safe enough to to explore so much more of what it means to be LGBTQ plus now uh, publicly. Sure. And we we realize that we're you know 
it, it's funny. You always see the memes and, and little gifts and videos online where it's like people asking silly questions like, well, who's the girl in the relationship or asking lesbians like who's the man mm -hmm. or, right. or asking who's going to walk down the aisle at the wedding or, you know, who's going to be wearing blue or it's like there's all these traditions that we don't really have or there's no real rule book for it. And so what we are, the other leg of our channel is kind of exploring those things as a gay couple. And like we're going to we're going to have a wedding planning episode coming up. Where oh, great. Yeah, like it's a lot of we're really just trying to have like a positive infrastructure for the community, interweb a lot of these things and also create a network where we can actually affect global change because American media is so about itself that I, I know myself and a lot of my friends want to know what else is going on in the world. And why don't we ask those people who are in those places what's going on in their home, you know? Well, it's firsthand knowledge, you know, it's, you know, you're not going to get that on the news, but we have, you know, because everyone has a webcam, everybody can be a reporter. And yeah. if nothing else, they can report on their experience or what's happening around them. They don't have to be, you know, Walter Cronkite, they just have to be a witness to something. And I think mm -hmm. that, you know, I think that's a really great thing because, also, aside from travel, when we get to travel again, yeah. which God knows when that will be, I think it, one thing I've noticed, and I was talking to our uh, Velma last night, she, we said that the one good thing that has come out of this is that you realize that it is a global community, that you're one click away from people. When Fran Drescher was on last week, I had people leaving comments from Europe, from China, from South America, and they're all sitting there watching this one thing mm -hmm. and you realize the power that you have and the platform you have mm -hmm. yeah it's, it really does feel like if if anything has been amplified during this time is the responsibility that comes with that platform um yeah and also i got off on a tangent and totally messed up but yeah people have been asking about it <laughs> podcast what they don't know is our eight minute episodes are actually edited from 45 minute conversations so right. the, the i think the 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 uh, what this is going to be turning into is we'll have the eight minute highlight reel on YouTube. And mm -hmm. then we're going to be finding a podcast platform that we, we will release the long form audio so that anyone who is interested in the long form conversation, they have that. Yeah. I think I found that because I've been doing long form shows and I like long form conversation because you really can get in depth with things, but there is short attention span as well. So sometimes I'll put clips out of highlights that people can see. And then if they want to go back and watch the whole thing or the audio version, I think you're giving people options and more yes. information is never a bad thing. 100%. Yes. <laughs> so let's talk about your career. I, um, I, I think so many of the people who are watching this, I mean, there are people who obviously know you from the Disney stuff, but the gay people are going to remember you from um, Cobra King or King Cobra. Mm -hmm. Which is it? Which is it? King Cobra. Okay. It's one of the two. There's a well, king. The there's a called Cobra. Cobra Killer, if I'm not mistaken. Oh. Yes. Okay. See, there you go. Thank you. Um, and I, I thought that that was really a very, for you, for somebody coming out of that background to do something that was that edgy and that risky sort of uh, was a big deal for you. It must have been. Mm -hmm. It was, it was a very, uh, it was a very intense decision to have made, especially during a time when I wasn't um, comfortable, uh, comfortable enough to come out yet. Cause a lot of people wanted to make the movie about my coming out. And I was like, oh, wow. more, discussions that this movie should be about because there's so there's so many issues within the adult industry and in, in underage pornography right. and how accessible it is and how predatory it can be and how easily um, young people can fall into it because of the predators. And so a lot of people wanted to make it about my coming out. And my issue with it, it was, I don't want to, the movie, I, I'm lucky enough that I'm the star of this movie alongside incredible people, James Franco, Christian Slater, Alicia Silverstone, Molly Ringwald, oh, like, yeah. what a cast. And I already knew that I, I was lucky enough to, to be in that position that I didn't want to make it even more about me, but it actually, mm -hmm. I think in turn made people mad that I, they thought another straight person was playing another gay role. And on top of it, a salacious story and an intense story and a dark story. So wow. people were getting very upset that it was me because they thought that I was straight. But the reality was, is I was trying to push forward um, issues that 
because I also watched um, Life After Porn and like, you know, these people are just um, uh, fond over and obsessed when they're working in the industry, but when they're done, they're it thrown away happen. and they're ostracized and yeah. they fall into so many sad, dark categories that really affect them so deeply. And it really, it really hurt my heart. Uh, and not, not, I think the biggest thing I really found was the empathy that I have for people in this community that I didn't mm -hmm. really know that um, I was going to have, but it, it does make me feel like a, a more well-rounded, informed person. Yeah, I'm a, I obviously know a lot of porn stars, including the person the movie was loosely based on, which is Brent Corrigan, mm -hmm. um, is a friend of mine. And um, I've always said, and nothing against anyone who does porn, but I think that the porn industry attracts people who are least equipped emotionally to deal with it because they're looking for this acceptance, this attention. They don't realize how fleeting it is in that Again, same thing with um, news reporting is that everyone with a webcam today is a porn star. So you're even more disposable. So yeah. it's um, it's a very hard situation. There's also, again, drugs involved and other things that happen. Mm -hmm. um, but I thought that it was amazing to show your versatility and then to go to from that to being on stage with Al Pacino and Judith Light. Now, mm -hmm. granted, you are the one in your underwear, but you know, as it should be. But that was like, talk about being shot out of a cannon and being on stage with two giants. What was that experience like? Oh, that was incredible. I love, we, I, I was in the development of the play uh, for two years. Mm -hmm. So we did a different incarnations and even the run that you just posted the picture of, we changed the script. that was changing um, sometimes on a, uh, every week or sometimes every other week. I mean, it was really, it was a masterclass in not only keeping things fresh, but learning how to, how to change, you know, constantly and adapt and uh, learning not just character, character building and really digging deep, but like learning it from people who, like you said, are giants. <laughs> Cause wow. I mean, Half, there, there was half the time when they were discussing plot and what was necessary, X, Y, and Z, that I was just like a, a little baby sponge soaking it up from all these giants. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I just, I remember seeing it and thinking to myself, oh my God, what an opportunity to not only work with these people as a colleague and really a peer, but also to learn. Because I knew... Um, I remember people who saw the show when it began and it changed quite a bit by the time I saw it. So oh, yeah. that also has to keep you on your feet. Totally. And I will even say Judith is a lot of my inspiration for the activism that I've, I've implemented into my life. Yeah. Oh, she's an incredible person. And um, what an ally we have in Judith. Certainly. Yeah, we do. Um, so let's talk quickly about hairspray. What would, how did you get hairspray? I sent in a tape. They asked for a self tape. And it's funny as an actor, most of the time we're always like, Oh, a self tape <laughs> crap. Cause you, always, I don't know what it is. I think now the industry is much different than when we were doing hairspray a couple years ago. Cause mm -hmm. now everything's on self tape because of Corona. But sure. I heard, I kept hearing I was still in the race for it. And then months later they asked that I go into a dance audition. And I remember Jerry was on FaceTime and mm -hmm. I learned the nicest kids dance. And at the end, at the end of the session, he he I, I was on FaceTime, did the dance that I that they showed me. And he said, Yeah, as far as I'm concerned, you can do it. And then a couple weeks wow. later they were making the deal. So it was that like a, it felt like a process I wasn't really a part of. <laughs> But again, what an impact you must have made on them if they were that confident from the game. And Jerry is such a great spotter of talent anyway. Oh, I love I, it, liter, it. That experience was so, so incredible and so extravagant. And it was just the best. It was the best of the best. I got to work with incredible. I, I'm such a, a, a Broadway theater nerd mm -hmm. in my life. And so getting to do that show with that cast was really, it was such a dream. 
and so and part of history because again as we said it's something now it's on film and people will see it forever and yeah. i and i thought you were great i i said it that night and i said god he captures that excitement in the youth in many ways um better than many links i've seen and there have been links i've liked for so many different reasons but all around you so impressed me thank you so much you know, i really what a night that was again i was there live and there was such excitement in that studio mm -hmm. well i don't even think people people at home saw the extravagance of what we were doing but being a part of it in real life and seeing how much of the universal lot they utilized for the set they built an entirely new state-of-the-art sound stage everything every every costume piece was hand stitched every like the it was it was the tops yeah. When you guys had to run around, I mean, again, people don't know yeah. that they had to run to sets. I mean, there was just madness during the commercial breaks. It was a breakneck it was speed. Fun, though. <laughs> well, again, it was whether you had to make, you have to make it work. Yeah. Um, all right, everyone, get out your scripts. If you have a script, um, and again, I don't see our motor mouth, but we may not have her video. So who knows? But our, because I know I've got Mr. Mark Shaman is backstage and we're on a deadline. So Garrett, I'm going to take you out, but I'll bring you out in for your, um, for your entrance. So everyone get ready. Hold on. Okay. Oh, there she is. Thank you, Jesus. Okay. Uh, and now the Billy Masters players will present a special scene. We have an intro and everything. I will be reading, um, stage directions. And uh, our seaweed, if you want to read the two lines for Inez, if you've got it there, you can be Lil Inez if you'd like, if you see it. If you don't, I'll do them. I've always wanted to be Lil Inez. Oh, and we don't have two cast members, so I will once again be playing Penny because of my penchant for sleeping with darker skinned men. And I may be reading Amber as well. So there you go. Here we go. Okay, back lot where we left off with everyone meeting and greeting. Motormouth Mabel, oh, hold on, I gotta get ready. Okay, Motormouth Mabel enters the room. There's platters of tunes and food on the table. What else would you expect from? Miss Motormouth Mabel. Yeah. Mama, I brought home some friends. For the love of music, come on in. Well. If it isn't the ever sparking Sir Link Larkin. <laughs> Always nice to see you, Miss Motormouth. I'm Penny Lou Pingleton, and I'm very pleased and scared to be here. Well, aren't you a cutie? Hold on, I gotta go back. Hold on. <laughs> Tracy, could you say your line again? Sorry. This is just so afrotastic. I'm Seaweed's friend. Tracy, may I say how thrilled I am to meet you? I miss your show. And I enjoy you on Corny. It's all thanks to seaweed. That's nice of you to say. Now come on in and let's start to spin. And they start to dance the dirty boogie. This is interesting. It's the dirty boogie. Why can't we dance together like this on TV? Wouldn't that be something? Well, why not? Oh, you think we haven't tried? We've talked to the station. We presented the mayor. We've even petitioned the governor. And what do we get? Negro Day. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone begins to dance together when the door opens and Amber, oh, now I'm Amber. Amber enters and she sees Link and runs to him. Link, what are you doing in this huge crowd of minorities trying to fit in why are you here when i didn't show up under the bleachers i followed you in my new car i'm glad you came here jump on in the door opens again and velma wearily enters she runs to protect her daughter amber amber is that you yes i'm me oh <laughs> my baby well, has anyone touched you? Too late to hustle. 
you we've been seen by von tussle motormouth what's going on here are you brainwashing these children we're only dancing oh i should have known you would be at the bottom of this barrel <laughs> <laughs> the door opened, opens again, and now Edna, carrying a takeout bag, enters. Tracy? Oh, that was you I saw. Wilma! Come on, it was the kids I seen. Mama, what are you doing here? I had a sudden craving for chicken and waffles, so we drove up to Ruby's takeout across the way. Hello, everyone. I'm Tracy's mom. So you're what spawned that? Excuse me? Ah, I guess you two are living proof that the watermelon doesn't fall far from the vine. Tracy, be a dear and hold mommy's waffles. Edna advances towards Velma when the door opens and Wilbur comes in. All right, a party. Anyone for chicken and waffles? <laughs> if we get any more white people in here, we'll be a suburb. Motormouth, <laughs> I will deal with you later. Amber, let's get back to the right side of the tracks if the cars are still there. Velma holds the door open for Amber. Let's go, Link. Amber, you're being rude to these people. Amber, come. Link, come. Amber, go. Amber is dumbstruck and then forces, whatever happened to the spiceless, spineless boy I fell in love with? Mother, come. With pleasure. And they're gone. Edna. I didn't care for them. Are all white people like that? No, just most. Oh, I know how we can start changing things. If kids saw us all dancing together on TV, they'd realize that we're not so different after all. You saying that you and Link would be willing to dance with us on Negro Day? Oh, Tracy. No, we're not dancing on Negro Day. You're going to crash White Day. White Day is every day. You gotta be more specific. It's mother-daughter day on the show. How's that for a specific thing? Miss Motormouth, you work for the station. They could never tune, turn you and the line as away. And once the two of you break the barrier, we'll all be free to dance on TV. That thinking's downright revolutionary. We'll set off sparks like Rosa Parks. Hold it, children. Think it through. What if they call the cops? Then we'll walk off the show together. There's Link and me, and I'm sure we can get others. No dancers, no show. This daughter of yours is a pistol. We've always taught her to do what's right and give correct change. Wait, hey, D D Tracy, you can't. They'll fire you for sure. If I'm the only one. But if it's all of us. Well, no, no, I can't. I'm sorry. Look, I like these people, but whether or not they dance on TV won't get me a recording contract. I'm not like you. You've got brains and personality and talent. Me? The Miss Hairspray contest is my one chance to be seen nationwide. I'm not throwing away my shot. You don't think segregation is wrong? Sure. I guess. But why, why is it my problem? Come on. I'm leaving, and you should too. Link, you and me together. I was just starting to think. Me too. But I don't know. I, it's getting too complicated. And then there's Amber. Sorry, little darling. Link makes a beeline out the door. Tracy is lost. I'm sorry, Tracy. Edna gently comforts Tracy. No, oh, Mama. How could I think that Link Larkin would ever care about someone like me? And why wouldn't he? You're a beautiful girl. And he's just 
boys are not the brightest thing. <laughs> Still, you give him time, I'm sure he'll figure out he's crazy about you. You have to say that. I'm my mother. I'm more than your mother. I'm a woman in love. We know stuff. But Tracy, is he right? Should you be risking your career? I never would have gotten on the show without seaweed. This is payback time. That's my girl. Okay. So this is how it's going to go tomorrow. Everyone bring your mothers. And daughters. And meet us around the corner from the studio and make signs. And put words on them. <laughs> Word of mouth. You and little Inez will walk in first. Me and mom will be right behind you. Excuse me? They'll never be able to shove them out the door with us blocking it. Tracy, I'm sorry, but no one said anything about my having to appear on television. <laughs> I'm sorry, but I simply cannot appear on TV at my present weight. What's weight got to do with this? Ain't nobody ever tossed this sofa to the curb for being too comfortable. <laughs> oh, but Miss Motocross, you're a celebrity. <laughs> but I am a simple housewife of indeterminate girth. The bigger the girth, the more your work. Mr. Turnblad, you don't mind that the missus here is an ample American, do you? Not at all. I think of her as prime real estate. <laughs> <laughs> now you're singing to the choir. <laughs> and singing. Mark, I know I've got to run, but thank you for doing this. Do you want to say anything before I get rid of you? I had all these people. What a surprise. Hey, Mark. <laughs> you got everybody here. Husband. And let me just go really introduce everyone. So Charlotte Crossley did it on National Tour. And did you go to Broadway too? You did? Okay. Chester Gregory. Chester Gregory with Seaweed on Broadway, correct? Yes. And on the road. Yeah, take care. And, and uh, three okay. weeks, but mostly Broadway, two and a half years, yeah. Garrett, of course, television, Nikki, film, Linda Hart, original mode, uh, original Velma. Did you ever, did you do it on the road too at some point, Linda? I'm sorry, did I what? Did you do it on the road as well? No, no Just not right. ever. Oh, well, that's in Seattle, I suppose that counts. And Bruce yeah. Lynch, of course, Broadway and national tour. And of course, from where all hairspray streams, Mr. Mark Shaman, yeah. composer, co lyricist, and actor. Oh, <laughs> and we're all Harlets. Yeah, no, no, no. that's right. We've got two Harlets here. I love these people, and I, but I have to go, Billy. Oh, Marky, I'm sorry. I know this was me. Don't worry. Thank you. Hi, Thank you for Mark. I love you. Hi. We'll be talking. Sure we'll be talking. Bye, all. sweetheart. We'll talk again later. Don't worry. Bye, honey. Bye. 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 So I'm going to just talk to the, the um, first off, thank you all for doing this. This was so much fun. It was great. Um, originally, what I was going to do is I was going to do the jail scene with Nikki and Garrett and just have Edna. And I said, well, let's get a little ambitious and see how many people we can get. Um, Nikki, did you tell me that um, this was the scene of your audition? Yeah, this was my screen uh, test audition scene. <laughs> wow. And who did you read? What, did you just read like with somebody like me just do it, feeding you lines? Yeah, it was funny. They actually, um, at the screen test, they hired an actor. I don't remember his name, but he was from Frasier. And I remember and when he came in, I was so starstruck. He was like the first celebrity that I like saw in LA that I recognized from a TV show. And so he read that with me. And uh, yeah, that was my screen test. See, from, and it's come full circle. Um, Shalo, how did Shalo? How did you get involved with the show? <laughs> well, <laughs> yes, yes, I did not sleep my way to the top. Well, <laughs> that we know from a uh, former Harlet. <laughs> well, first of all, Mark Shaman and I—we've been friends. He, I've known him since he's sixteen years old, and that's my son in the background. Um, Hi, baby. See, uh, we could have had him too. He could have been a, a seaweed. That would have yeah. been nice. <laughs> so, but did you did you do it, Charlotte? Was it the first time? Did I see your first performance in New Jersey? Um, yes. 
He had gotten the press rehearsal for the national tour. Yes, I did. Uh, uh, how 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 I came to do this was yeah. um, when I heard that Mark and uh, and Scott were working on the project in 2002. Um, I was just you know I didn't think there would be anything. I, it didn't even occur to me. And then the show opened and it had great acclaim. And then my friend said, you know, you should audition for Motormouth, blah blah blah. And then when they we, when there was a national tour that was slated for um, to, uh, whole auditions in L A. I went to an open call at the Madeline Clark <laughs> and I Michelle Crossley, a legendary harlot, just showing up in an open call. Nikki, see, you're not the only one. You just show up. The reason I what? did it is because when I got my first start in show business in Chicago in hair, I went to an open call. I was right out of high school and I said, you know, I'm going to go back to basic because I had been away from the theater for 30 years. Yeah. Well, well you've been so singing. I, I, you were very busy. Well, I, you know, I was raising my family. My son had just turned, he was about to turn 10. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was a stay at home mom. I was just doing commercials and just taking care of my family. Right. And so when I got a chance to audition, so I went to the Valley, I prayed my way through the Valley, got <laughs> there, I, w I got it, I stood in line, and I remember I was wearing, I was wearing black leggings and a leopard blouse, and I pulled my braids <laughs> up in a ponytail, and I slapped on some lipstick looking a little trashy, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> um, went through the whole, got in line with other singers and just worked my way through, and by the time I got to Bernie Chelsea, uh, he looked at my page, he went, oh, and just handed me the script and said, come back <laughs> on this day. And so I went home and I, um, my friend Lisa Pacero worked with me and my friend Alexa, uh, my, my friend Alexa Jago worked with me on the script. And oh my God, it was a lot of tears, but I went through and it was deep because when we got to like the next to the final auditions in LA, it was the best in LA. Baby, those bitches came out. And I was like, I was like, who am I? It really made me think, who are you? Who do you want Motor Mouse to be? What do you want her to represent? Right. What do you want to bring to this? And I brought my insanity and then they hired me. And uh, Bruce and I worked with you recently at the Studio One closing party where you sang the sang I Know Where I've Been. And again, yeah. come full circle. It's the gift that keeps on giving. And speaking of gifts that keep on giving, the legendary Miss Linda Hart. Look at you. Another staggering harlot. Linda, how'd you get involved with the show? You did it from the very beginning. Weren't you in the first readings? Uh, yes. First of all, I, I can't say another word until I uh, send my love to my darling sister, Charlotte. Love you, yeah. love you, love you, me too. My precious, precious friend. Uh, I replaced Charlotte as a harlot and Jennifer you did indeed. replaced yep. me. Yeah, right. A, so those are some uh, big worn out shoes to, to wear. <laughs> yeah. uh, but back, back to hairspray. Yes. Uh, if I may, I have to go back to Mark because uh, Mark was Bette Midler's uh, vocal arranger mm -hmm. and, and therefore a rehearsal pianist. And uh, I believe Charlo and Ula and Sharon Red had just left the Harlots and, and I came in and it's a, a studio on Olympic near La Cienega. And you walk in, and there's Mark in the same green shirt. He must have <laughs> hundred of them because he wears that shirt every week, rain, shine, sleet, or heat. And eating a bagel, having a Diet Coke, and plunking, really plunking the piano. I'm sorry he's not here. Uh, and we became friends. And I think, Charlotte, you said he was 16. I think when I met him, he was... Uh, 17 going on 18. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And, uh, and so we became friends. Yeah. And then they wrote a show, they meaning Mark Shaman and Scott Whitman, wrote a show called Living Dolls, which right. Richard Malt be directed. And uh, Lynn Meadows produced. And, and so uh, we did that together. And that just uh, sort of deepened the friendship, the relationship uh, on stage and off stage. So then Hairspray 
sorry, that was the long way around, not nearly as long as it is. But when <laughs> hair spray, uh, my husband and I, Bill, who, who's right over there. Uh, who is we, our tech we, wizard? Uh, Thank you, Bill, for helping us. We were in our house in Los Angeles and literally the phone rang. And it was Mark and Scott. And uh, they have a nickname for me. They call me Meese, M-E-E-S-E. -E -E. Uh, that's <laughs> another story. Uh, they called me and they said, hey, Meese, uh, we have a part for you. And I said, what? And they said, we're writing this musical, uh, Hairspray. Did you ever see it? And I said, yeah, yeah, I think I did. Uh, I don't know that I could say Divine and John Waters, but I do remember Deborah Harry. Yeah. And I said, uh, yeah, I do. And they said, well, we're going to do a workshop and we want to bring you in. I was in LA, bring you into New York. And uh, and so I was there from the beginning, yeah. uh, the very beginning. And I had, it was me and Harvey and Marissa, I believe. Yes, I think right. The three originals. Yep, and there was then, another link at that point, I remember. Yes, and there was another Amber. Yeah, oh, and, I didn't know that. And maybe another Penny. Oh, what? Uh, yeah. But uh, anyway, and so they offered me the part. I flew there. I, I read it. And, you know, it's funny. I'm wearing, Billy, this blonde wig for you. Oh, yes. <laughs> I, I have to show the picture. So yes. uh, Nikki will remember. Nikki will remember this at the opening night party for the film at the premiere. Here's a picture of Linda and I. And we were talking about this last night. And I said, remember that, that blonde wig you wore? And I looked today and I'm like, she's got the same wig I on. I remember it. I do. I've got pictures of you guys together in it as well. Yeah. And you were so beautiful in that film, Nikki. You were, you, your heart and soul were in every shot. Uh, God bless you. And this you is an that. original person saying it. That was <laughs> yeah. hard. And honestly, I can tell you, Bruce, just doing that scene with you right now, just, I was, I've been a massive Bruce Blanche fan since I'm a child. So I'm going to like have to go run a few blocks after this to get out my, <laughs> I've, I've seen Bruce at parties and at, at, at events, but this was a one for the books today to perform with all of you, Carlo and Chester, who I've met and I've adored for so long. You know I love you, Gregory. Come on now. Love you. Um, well, let's, let's, uh, let's actually talk to Mr. Chester Gregory because we have a funny story of how we met. Chester's voice, <laughs> Chester's voice just blows my mind. Your voice takes me to a whole other place, Jester Gregory. Ah, he's, uh, he's, uh, not only is he an unbelievable talent, but he is one of the sweetest guys. Uh, I was with our mutual friend to all of us, uh, Jennifer Lewis, the middle, the missing harlot. Um, we were down. Where were we? Oh, we were at uh, Debbie Allen's hot Debbie Allen, yeah. Hot cracker. And. And so I was with Jennifer. Typically, I would drive, but for whatever reason, Jennifer says, oh, no, Debbie sent a car. So I said, okay, I'll leave my car at your house. And we got down there. We stayed so late at the party. Our car was nowhere to be found afterwards. And now picture Jennifer Lewis walking around the parking lot saying, baby, can you give us a ride back to Sherman Oaks? <laughs> And Chester, Chester sees us wandering around, and he's like, "We'll drive you." And uh, I, I said, "This is this is somebody as beautiful inside as he is outside." Um, Chester, how'd you get the show? So, um, all right. So, thank I was you for in, doing uh, it, honey. Huh? Thank you for doing this. Oh no, my pleasure, my pleasure, totally. Uh, so. Uh, so around 2002, I was doing a show in the Chicagoland area that toured called The Jackie Wilson Story, where I paid right. tribute to Jackie Wilson. And we toured and we ended up at the, well, we were, we were in DC at the time, Hairspray um, was in previews. And so uh, Debbie McIntyre, who was just like a legend in the Broadway community and just unifying a lot of people, had comps to the previews of Hairspray. And she invited me and, um, 
And I was like, okay, you know, okay, I'll check out a 60s musical. Okay, check it out and see what it's about. And I didn't know it was in previews or anything like that. But then when I saw the show, I fell in love with the show. I was like, oh my God. And I found out that it wasn't even open yet. And I told her, you know, that everybody, that I love the show. It's not even open yet, but it's going to win all the Tonys and all this stuff. And then so fast forward, the Jackie Wilson story went to the Apollo Theater in New York. And I got a chance to perform there for a month. And then um, uh, it started getting all these crazy reviews and stuff from the New York Times and all of this stuff. It's, you know, and then, um, and then I signed with this manager who then connected me to do a performance for the Manhattan Theater Club. And mm-hmm. the original cast of Hairspray was there. And so they performed like a segment from the show. I think it was like, you can't stop the beat or something. And then I sang like lonely teardrops. And I think like several people from the creative team were there. And then somehow there was some follow up and they were like, we want to bring him in. And so they brought me in for Seaweed the very night of the Tony Awards. They saw me the next morning at like 9.30 in the morning (laughs) to do the audition. And then Three weeks later, I was in the show as seaweed. It was it was crazy. It was all just like a like a whirlwind. Um, just so fabulous. Um, and Bruce Valanche, Bruce the legendary, yeah. Mr. Bruce Valanche, and his hairspray <laughs> shirt sweatshirt. Thank Which you. I haven't so worn much. since the premiere uh, in Westwood of the movie. Oh wow! See, I West- dug it out. I dug it out of that vault. God love you. So um, you've obviously known Mark forever, and, and practically everybody in the cast forever. I think I- I actually met him, I think, uh, working with Peter Allen, uh, which really? was before, which was in the late seventies, before Bet he did some work for Peter, and then of course uh, he was involved with Bet. We went on tour with uh, uh, yeah, with Luther Vandross, who was a backup singer, and uh, we would uh, we were, we were assigned to sit on either side of Luther during the flights because he was terrified. <laughs> and as we were going, as we were taking off, Luther would go. I'm gonna die. <laughs> we had to hold him down, so we we all became very close at that point. And then, uh, then I uh, life went on, and uh, Mark and Scott wrote hairspray, and I went up to Seattle to try out. It, you know, it right. And uh, it was wonderful. I mean, it was clear it was going to be a huge hit. I think the night I was there was the first night Maddie Morrison went in as Link because oh. the link the link had walked, and Maddie was the understudy. And Linda, you made. Me- you may, I may have this wrong, Linda, so correct me if I'm wrong. No, but that's I think I think it was the first his first night. And and Harvey it was brilliant. And you know, I thought, well, I could maybe play this. And then I didn't think about it. I was doing Hollywood Squares and uh, they were putting the, the tour out and they uh, they called me and said, Would you be interested in, in doing the tour? Because I was on TV every night. And uh, I Which said helps. Yeah, absolutely. and they said, Would you come and audition? And so I said, All right. <laughs> and you still had the beard at the time. We should tell what? people you still had the beard at the time. I had the beard. Yes, I I had the beard. I'll tell you about that in a minute. Okay. And I went to the audition at, at that at the dance studio in Hollywood, and I sat next to this gorgeous, adorable blonde boy. And I was I was nervous when I got in, and then I was so busy hitting on him, and it was awesome. <laughs> who wound up playing Link on the tour. And I was very busy hitting on Austin. And they said, okay, you're up. Okay, and I went into the and I, you know, just kind of went into what I was doing. And they, you know, that got a call back. And uh, so I went to the call back because it, it, initially it was just Jack O'Brien and uh, Jerry Mitchell. And I went back and uh, I went into the room with the call back and everybody was there. The producers, I mean, the people who put a dollar and a half in and happened yeah. to live in LA were there. It was this array of people. And um, uh, and I did it. And I, I did uh, Timeless with Lenny Wolpe, who's a wonderful actor, but didn't mm-hmm. get it. And then I did um, uh, Edna's uh, telephone monologue right before at the, uh, before Timeless, with the phone mm-hmm. that flies off stage. Oh, I love that scene. And, uh, and then Scott Whitman came over to me and said, do you really want to do this? Because they like you. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, what, did you were just you're, doing you're, it before? You're, you're going around the country for a year? I said, I'm kidding. I would love to. And I looked at Austin was there. I said, will he be in it? And he, said, <laughs> he said, well, call you. I'll tell you all about that. And then, so then I got it. I went to rehearsal and uh, in New York. And uh, they said, well, you have to shave. And I thought, I, I tried to talk them into a bearded lady. 
That would have been funny. And and uh, John Waters said, you know, that's asking the audience to make another buy. They'll buy that it's a man, but they won't buy that it's a woman with a hormone problem. <laughs> so I shaved, they had me shave the beard on Regis and Kelly. I remember <laughs> that. They shaved the beard and Regis is Barbara, Saul of Little Italy. <laughs> and I was bleeding all over the place. And uh, Kelly was looking at me with such horror. I thought Kathy Lee must be standing behind me. <laughs> and then and then I went off. And then, so we, I, I did it. I did it for a year on the road with Charlo and, uh, yep. and Austin. And That's then we, uh, uh, and after a year, uh, um, they, they, uh, Michael McKean had followed Harvey into the show for five months, and they, he was leaving, and Peter Scolari, who played Wilbur, was leaving. And so they brought me and uh, uh, Todd Sussman in, along with a few other people from, the, from the, uh, the road. And so he came into the thing, and there was Chester, and uh, Linda had left already, I think. Had you left? Yeah, well, we never did it together. I think uh, uh, Jackie was in. No, no, Jack was, no, uh, Jackie was in. Barbara was Walsh was, was already in it. Right. Barbara right. Walsh was in it uh, on Broadway. And right. uh, and so I came in and did it for a year, and it was my favorite thing ever. I just I just love doing it. And people keep saying, uh, how do you do eight a week? And I said, well, you know, every new audience is new, and it pushed the OCD button. But I think the real reason you can do eight a week of that show is that it's such a party, so joyous. You know, if well, I, I think for Red you know, Grave, doing Medea and killed my children and swept them around the stage, I would be so lighthearted. But to get you out there you and realize make your own they're fun. all there to have a great time, uh, you know, it's, a, it's like a gift. Also, I have to say, it was for two years I was surrounded by the most talented people I've ever met. I mean, every single person in every dynamite, every nice kid in town, everybody in the show. We would do benefits on Monday for AIDS charities, whatever city we were in. And they got like off leash and got to sing other songs. And it was staggering how good they are. And uh, so I, I don't know if I'll ever have a situation that will do that. It was, uh, it was great to me. And I stole the bra. <laughs> well, I don't the only one who still flows. <laughs> so we'll, eventually what you're saying is if you had a basement we'd have a video tour of yours <laughs> yeah well there are video is that what you're asking there yeah. are bootleg videos of me yes well i've seen i've seen them on video i mean that's the thing uh, is that well, we did well we did ryan seacrest show out here we all sang you can't stop the beat ryan seacrest had a date so much fun it was a lot you know, of fun. But, but I will but, say uh, that our this friend, is. The bootlegger has made, like, made a tape of us in Chicago and on Broadway and at the Pantages. So I have, I do have illegal. You know. Well, that's all right. You know, they'll, they'll show up on YouTube. And the thing is, is that, again, this is kind of historic because we have people from television, from film, national tour, and original Broadway company. I said, I can't ask somebody from London to come in. It's too exhausting. <laughs> Um, I want to. Um, what, honey? Would I be able to say something about? You Bruce? can say whatever you want, Linda Hart. Okay, Bruce Valanche. How wonderful to see! To see, we're both wearing the same wig. Uh huh. Exactly. But look, Bruce, <laughs> tomorrow. Uh, I, tomorrow you know, I'm, I'm I'm quarantine Turner here. <laughs> Tomorrow the hair burner is coming in and uh, and the doing hair burner. and the hair burner and she, remember and she's shining me up so see Nikki it wasn't just you and I worrying about our hair everybody's worrying about <laughs> oh, hair. Please. are you kidding me? I just like <laughs> myself I look like I could play the dog in Peter Pan <laughs> Man, I want to connect uh, I want to connect this story Billy yes go so, ahead honey so Bruce when I sang with uh, with Bet, uh, Jerry Blatt had been the writer. And then Bruce would come in and his job, and, and you correct me, Bruce, his job was to punch it up. What mm -hmm. Bet said behind his back was it just has to be fucking funnier and fucking faster. <laughs> <laughs> what Bet said 
like every day. Faster and funnier. Faster and, funnier. and position and attitude. So then that's where uh, Bruce and I met, uh, was through Bette Midler. But then Bruce had a wonderful relationship with my brother, the great Larry uh, Hart, Larry Hart. <laughs> who yep. passed away. Right. Larry Hart wrote the black version of Cinderella. He wrote yep. Cinderella uh, with Michael Jackson producing. And be, be, right before Sisterella, he wrote a show that not only did Bruce Valanche star in, but Ozzy Osbourne phoned in his part every mm -hmm. night. You know, we, we come from evangelists, so you know, ask and you shall receive. Amen. So, <laughs> ask uh, yeah. Ozzy and Bruce, and we were there at the Las Vegas. Stage. Yes, and try. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm weaving. I'm weaving. I got my needle out with the water. At the, at the cashman, that was us. At the Lair cashman, Bay, the same, the same kids. Was, at the cashman theater, and precious darling, Jesus loving Charlo came in and did that. But Charlo had also been singing with me in my gospel group when we went to the White House. Oh, okay. wow. He went to the White House. And who were my backup singers? Charlo, Peggy, and Charles Randolph Wright. Oh, jeez. Wow. <laughs> These were the people that went to the White House with me, and we did like a freedom of religion thing. Mm -hmm. And Charlo and Bruce have been in my life since Bette Midler. I mean, I'm sorry she's not here because we could really – shed some glory on her. I love you both so much. Yeah. Bruce, I know you are a neighbor in Hollywood. We're not we're not there now, but wow, yeah. we have to have we have to have a party. We have well, Linda and I, Linda and I were talking last night and yeah, Shiloh and I have talked about that. Um we have to do a Harlet show. Um yeah. I think that yeah, would be yeah. hysterical. While we're still breathing. Yeah, well, exactly. <laughs> really, Guys this is really staggering. Yes, uh, guys, I've got to I've got to finish up with Nikki and Garrett. So I'm going to put everyone else backstage. If you want to keep watching, and I'll talk to you afterwards. Okay, Stay backstage, thank you, thank Linda. You. Thank you for doing it, Linda. I adore Linda Hart, Chester Gregory, who I couldn't love more. Thank you, Chester, for doing this and for playing Little Inez. See now, there's Range. <laughs> thank you for having me. It's an honor. Thank you, and thank you for that ride so many months ago. Oh yes. <laughs> uh, thanks, Chester. Uh, Charlo, Charlo, my darling, my angel, thank you for doing this. You know I love you. I needed this. This is great. Love I you. needed this. Thank you so much, Charlo. And of course, Bruce. It was uh, best. Yeah, Aaron, it's wonderful to see. Nikki, thank you so much. Yeah, and, Bruce, what is, and Bruce, what is this? This yeah. might be your fourth time on this show. You know, and I could have done the Naked Boy singing show. I watched. No, it was so, no, I was so funny because I, I think I said during the show, if I weren't having you on this show, I, I would have had you on both. I knew, and, I knew, and I didn't realize this was like a surprise uh, thing. Appearance. Yeah, but so, that's, I'm, well, you know, you try. Well, but, you know. But uh, yeah, so I mean, I'm I'm a perennial. What can I do? Yeah, exactly. Look, everything I do, as I've said this so many times, when I started the calm 25 years ago, I said it then. I'll say it now. Without Bruce Falanch, there would be no Billy Masters, oh and God. so I many of us owe a debt. The lobster pot of your guests. You, <laughs> you actually There's are. No place else to go. You wind up there. I love it. I'm well, not. you're certainly not the crabs. I'll tell you that. <laughs> well, Thank you. Man. Brucey, thank you so right. much. Thank you. Take care. Uh, I got to talk to now my link and my Tracy. So I was going to do this earlier, but, you know, we had to get Marky in. So this is this really the first time that you guys have met? Yeah. Yeah. And I'm thinking that we probably have, like, cross-promotion with both of your podcasts. I'm thinking, uh, especially, uh, Garrett, I thought about you doing your talking about being being out and and their stories because Nikki has such a fresh story. And you both, you know, you both went through a similar thing in your own time. And I think this really shows with the three of us that there is no way to come out. And you just have to do it in your own time. That's actually the episode that's dropping today, or the the video is uh, with uh, 
Joey Graceffa, Graceffa. I always almost say his name wrong, and then I want to be the dance. <laughs> um, but we were we 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 talk about how there's no real right way to come out. It's just about finding your comfort level and somebody you feel safe with to even talk about it if you're feeling tentative, and you know, really just trying to make sure people understand there's no right way to do it. You know, Nikki, I'm wondering, because you just did it this, you know, as I said, just a month ago, um, did you get, was there any black, black, black lash there? I almost said black lash. Was there any backlash to you when you came out? Did you get any haters? Um, yeah, I mean, well, you know, it's interesting. <laughs> I was called, it was funny. My publicist and I were talking and she told me, she was like, you know, you've been called the F word. And I was like, Fat? Yeah, I've been called fat my entire life. What's new? Like, tell me something I don't know. And then when she told me, no, it was the other F word. And I was like, really? Mm. There are still those people out there? Okay. Um, yeah. You know, but for me, I wasn't going to let it literally dim my, you know, damper my parade, dim my rainbow. It was honestly, like, we spoke about the most freeing experience of my life. And I'm just like we spoke about, there's no proper way to come out. I think it's everybody's own journey. Everybody kind of said to me, oh my gosh, but you're 31. And I'm like, yeah, and? Like, <laughs> right. Okay. Uh, so what? You know, I think people come out in their 30s and their teens and there's some people come out in their 50s. It's all about doing what's right for you, following your own path and, um, you know. And being authentic, like you said earlier. Yeah, it was it was just the time. The timing was right. It uh it just was about time for me to just start the rest of my life. Garrett, what about you? Because uh, I remember being around you and now again, I, I'm not you, so I don't remember backlash that I read online, other than like you said, there were some people like, oh, why now? Or was he hiding it? Or why not earlier? But did you have any haters out there that came for you? Um, I had a, honestly, I didn't, I just made my own statement and put it on Instagram. <laughs> and I think it was like it. Uh, yeah, I figured it would be like everything else. Like I would post it and it would be gone in an hour or whatever. <laughs> uh, Sadly, the algorithm doesn't really let your audience see 90% of what you're doing anyway. Right. Of but course. Um, it ended, I, I was, I just like fleetingly put this up. And I remember talking to my fiance about it at the time. And he was like, why now? And I said, because we're just too happy. And I'm in a place in my life where the repercussions aren't worth me pretending to be something I'm not. Yeah, that, that's interesting because you are in a good place in your life. Do have a fiance, a very stable life. Did did that make it easier? You mean having come out? Yeah, because you were in a relationship, so you're coming out and in a relationship. Um, yes, I I think because we had already been through having to hide it for so many years, and that right. struggle of of um, trying to maintain a. A like a working career while I was secretly living another life. Um, so that uh, I'd already been through the hardest part and right. I felt like I was already, I was finally at a place where I had a stable team of people who supported me. I had friends who loved me and didn't really care about how it, as long as I was happy, they were happy for me. And then, you know, I, I, at the time I was, I was working steadily and I was like, well, if I lose jobs in the future, my resume outweighs any, any bias at this point. Like I, right. for every doubt they have, I have a character that can prove them wrong. So mm -hmm. my, my, it kind of like my work to get where I need to be is done to right. do this because sadly the industry peg holes you not as much today. I think, as it did, but I remember the industry 10 years ago is completely different than it was even two years ago. Then it's just, it's, it's so rapidly changing and thankfully in the right direction. Yeah. Um, and now Nikki, we're, we're talking about 10 years ago when you did hairspray, would you have been able to come out? Well, I don't, you know, it was interesting. You were I so never, young too. You know, I never really dated in high school. Um, mm -hmm. That wasn't my, I was just like really focused on my career. I just had laser focus. Um, so dating for me didn't become a thing until after hairspray really. 
I wow. literally had my first kiss on the set of Hairspray. I mean, come on. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's so ridiculously sweet, Garrett. It's annoying. Um, well, that's a pretty good first kiss, I have to say. Yes, I mean, and he's still. <laughs> Well, it wasn't Zac Efron. I hate to ruin like. Uh oh, the now you're ruining it. Yeah, who was I it? I hate to ruin the dreams of every woman and gay man in the world, but it wasn't. It wasn't. Oh. It was actually one of the backup dancers, uh, one of the uh, motor mouth dancers, actually, who's one of my dearest friends in the entire world, Anthony Carr. I'll say his name loud. Um, and I think it's really important that, you know, that relationship for me, he was actually one of the first people I came out to. Oh, wow. Yeah, I called him up and I was like, hey, I need to tell you something. And he was so open and receptive and was just there for me. And it was it was really beautiful. So I think back then, I don't know if it, um, I don't know if coming out was really on my mind back then. Right. But as I've gotten older, it, uh, it definitely found itself more and more at the forefront of like when I was in interviews, I felt like I was just at the, it was at the tip of my tongue and I was ready so many times. And, <laughs> and then I found myself backing up because this role or that role. And then I said, you know what? No, no. Whoever's going to hire me is going to hire me because I am who I am or because same thing as Garrett. I play the role, you know, my sexual orientation should not have any effect on what kind of character I play. If I play it and you hire me and I do a great job, then that's just it. Leave it at that. Yeah. And I think, Garrett, you talked about that is that, you know, whatever anybody would say to you, you already have the resume. Do you think that had you come out without the resume, it would have been harder? Honestly, I don't know because it yeah. wasn't my path. Right. You know, I um, think that it it probably made it easier for you because you were a known entity, but that brings its own problems. I think every situation has their pros and cons. I think there's always going to come bias and uh, people having their own point of view of what you are or maybe the thing they think they feel like they know you from. Mm -hmm. So they're like, whether we like it or not, we're all human. And I think we all come with a point of view and whether people want to see me as Tanner from Team Beach Movie Forever, or if they want to see me as Sean Paul Lockhart from King Cobra Forever, it's like, or Link right. from Beach Forever. It's like, I'm thankful that I've had these experiences. I can't say it's been super easy getting in the room for straight roles, yeah. um, but I'd rather be an advocate for being able to say that I did it and then I came out and that I can work to try and help change the narrative. Yeah, and I think that you also... Uh, you know, think to yourself how many, say, teen heartthrobs don't make the transition to adult roles that you have already. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have proven so much. And, and Nikki, the same thing is that, you know, a lot of people who would play a role that's like that, it would define them and they wouldn't even have the opportunities you've had. Both of you have been extraordinarily versatile. Thank you. Thanks. I think, you know, it's important. I always say there's a lot of layers to this onion and <laughs> there is, and you just got to start peeling them back. And, um, yes, Rick. what'd you say? Yes, Rick. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> peel them back and, and let people see the real you. And I think as I've gone on through different projects, it's interesting now that I look back, I have played lesbian. Um, I've played straight characters, you know, I've played questioning characters. So I think for me, it's all about just channeling myself into whatever role and letting it come out. But at the end of the day, I just want to make quality work and play characters, you know, that have heart and mean something. And Garrett, you have so much heart. Can I just say when I saw you as Link Larkin, because I watched the live version. Oh. And I was like, oh, my God, he's too cute for words. I just wanted to squeeze his little cheeks. And you were so talented. And you really just took my breath away. So thank you so I much. I adore you. I don't know that, but I adore you. Well, <laughs> I feel exactly the same. I remember I was in high school when your movie came out. And it influenced so much of what I was inspired by in music theater that it, it really, you know, it had a strong impact on my, on my development years. So thank you. What, Garrett, when you saw the movie, did it ever occur to you? Oh, I could play link. I wanted to be link. So really bad. so bad. It was one. Of, it's one of the few roles that I'm like, 
that's something I have to do. So again, like like Nikki, I mean, you both saw it and like, that's an, I have to do it. I think it's that's like, single mindedness. It's like a deep pull. It's like a deep need that you just can't, you know, you can't quench a thirst. You can't quench with anything else. Yeah. It seems to me I've known, again, I've known people. I, I always, when I see Maddie Morrison, who's a friend, I see Link. And to me, because he was the first one, I said the first one most people saw, he's the Link in my head. And when I see anyone else playing Link, I can appreciate them, but you have this image. And I think that carries with everybody who has done the roles in Hairspray. They are so indelible that there's going to be a part of you that says, oh my God, that's Link. That's Tracy. Mm. Well, what's so cool about Hairspray is there was like the original movie and then the Broadway show and then the movie again and then the live version. So I feel like every once in a while, uh, the new generations get a new adaptation of Hairspray and they get exposed to the story and the characters. And that's the magic of Hairspray is I think it's a timeless story and it will go on. And I think that's what's so special about it. Yeah. Yeah, and the fact that you guys both get to be part of that history, and anytime, I have to say, anytime I've been on the road and met, like, a new Tracy, or even gone to, like, a little regional place and say, oh, this is going to be like a high school production, then you see somebody with such a big voice in either of your roles saying, look at the opportunity they've gotten, and they're now part of that history. Mm -hmm. I actually have... Um, when the night of Hairspray, a friend of mine who was Zach's publicist when for the Hairspray movie, he ha- he gave me one of the Hairspray cans, like the the Ultra Clutch. Mm-hmm. Yep. And it has Zach's signature and my hope. I really want to get all the originating links to sign it. Oh, that would be great. Cool. Yeah. I mean, uh, and it's funny, I will say that um, I have, because Nikki will remember, at the premiere, they were giving us out the hairspray cans. I have a few of those. And on your set, afterwards, we had a party on the uh, live version set, and the few that were around on that set disappeared like that. And trust me, I know because I looked. I, I'll never forget, after the premiere, I was going back to my hotel, and there were, the paparazzi followed me back. This one guy, they had like eight foot cans of hairspray as props at the beginning of the carpet. He dragged it all the way down Park Avenue and waited <laughs> outside my hotel and was like, I, it was like two o'clock in the morning. He said, will you sign this? And I was like literally out there. I'm signing the whole thing. It was <laughs> cute, but it was so fun. Yeah. Again, people get so excited. And again, what I love about the show is that it, it's um something that you can watch with the whole family, that people get it on different levels. There is that subversive humor, and then there is the family humor. And I um I, I love when I go to see the show, and I'm like, oh, it's something that will every generation can bring their family. And then, again, at the, someday you guys may have kids, and you'll be able to bring them to see Hairspray. Mm-hmm. It's just, um, uh, I think it's just an extraordinary legacy. And um, I just can't believe, again, I look back and I'm looking saying, oh my God, we have Tracy and Link from two, I mean, the first time from two different mediums together. Yeah. And yet I will say you both look exactly the same. Uh-uh. Well, look, look, Garrett, it hasn't been that long for you. How many years ago was it, Garrett? Two? Two, maybe three. Yeah, it was... November, maybe. Oh, it, no, we. I think it it aired live like the very beginning of December. Okay, and Nikki, you look exactly the same. It will and be- Nikki, is it true that you were working in an ice cream um place, like a stone yeah, cold creamery or something? I was working in a cold stone creamery when I was sixteen. Uh, when I got cast, yeah. <laughs> and again, look at both. You what? That's where they told me the news. So you're actually working, making ice cream for people and get the call. I'm going to be the star of a movie. Well, I, was, I was making Sundays for New Line Cinema producers. I had no idea. I was asking <laughs> sprinkles or chocolate sprinkles. I had no idea that they were like the biggest executives in the world. I no and I've never asked you, Garrett, how did you get discovered? How did you even get started? I went to casting calls when I grew up in Detroit. 
And I ended up booking three auditions from that. Two of them individually each had 1,500 people at them. They told me wow. after. And so I was like, it happened twice. And so I figured something was working and life was <laughs> trying to like give me an idea. Uh, so I, um, I ended up booking this Days of Our Lives talent search. And oh, wow. um, I remember I came here, I only had one episode. And if, any, if anyone who's watching or even both of you, I'm sure know, like when, you're sh uh, when they do soap operas, they do like five episodes a day or something. Mm -hmm. So they went and I did my scenes and, and I still had the rest of the day and I got invited to a barbecue. And then it happened to be two people who were looking for a roommate. And because of this other uh, casting call I went to, there was a producer who was a part of a management company and then they wanted to represent me. And so I was like, oh, well, I, you know, life is g giving me just like little baby tools to inspire something. So I think I'm going to. I'm going to, you know, give Hollywood my, my, uh, my best shot. Was there something else you wanted to do at that time that you thought, Oh, I might want to be a singer or an artist or whatever. I've always said if I was going to do another job, the only other two I'd want to do would be, um, a history slash drama teacher. Oh, wow. Or, uh, cause it feels like not only teaching drama, but like teaching stories. It's like, we're storytellers. So it feels the same to me. Um, or I'd want to go into culinary school and be a chef. Oh, now that sounds good. Nick, what did you want to do? Did you want to do everything, anything else or you were just focused on this? I was very focused on this, but I, um, I wanted to study theology. I found oh. the study of religion fascinating. Um, so if I was going to do anything, I was, planning on studying theology with maybe like a minor in criminal justice. Um, but I, I really didn't know what I was going to use the degrees for. I was just hoping that acting worked. <laughs> well, clearly it has. Um, guys, thank you so much for doing this. Um, Garrett, tell people where they can see your videos. Um, what you mean? Like social media? Yeah. Angles, yeah. Yep. Sure. Oh, okay. So, uh, Instagram and TikTok and Twitter, uh, Garrett Clayton one and Garrett Clayton 91. If you want to see YouTube, it's a gay in the life, youtube.com slash a gay in the life. Cool. And Nikki, what about you? Um, you can find me on Spotify, iTunes and YouTube, Nikki nights. That's my podcast. Um, a new episode goes up Monday through Friday. Uh, and we just finished one today and you can follow me on Instagram at Nikki Blonsky at, TikTok, the real Nikki Blonsky. <laughs> um, yeah. And you could always find me on Cameo too. Uh, those are a lot of fun. I do the personalized videos for fans. So those are a blast. You can find cool. me there. And you know, that's the thing I think with this quarantine is that the fact that we're able to do this, you can still stay in touch with people. And it's, it's I've been, it, you get these combinations that you wouldn't get any other time. Because mm -hmm. when am I going to have, uh, you know, the TV link and the and the Tracy? Oh, now. So then maybe next time I'll get the TV Tracy and the film link. Oh, look at that. Oh. And I, I will say that I had asked Marissa. I said, you know, if Linda Hart couldn't do it, I said, maybe you could come on and be Velma. Marissa? <laughs> yeah. I just think, well, you had Marissa in yours. I love Marissa. We're oh, actually Marissa. friends in in life. So. Yeah, I, Marissa's one of the was was Marissa in the film version too? Nikki, did she have she had a oh no, Ricky had a cameo. Yeah. So Ricky has done all of them because she was in yours too, Garrett. Yeah. Ricky Lake is the key. Is the queen of hairspray. Yeah. Anyway, guys, thank you all for doing this. This has been so much fun. Garrett, thank you so much. I'll see you. Hopefully, if I get back to LA, I'll see you soon. Yeah, I'll see you soon. Okay, take care, Bye, Garrett. Garrett. And Nikki, thank you so much. This has been so much fun. Bye, guys. Um, everyone, thank you for watching Billy Masters Live. I know, oh my God, this wasn't even as long as the uh, Naked Boy singing. Oh my God, we had, we had, uh, oh, see, now I should have shown him. Uh, Look at this. Billy Murf Murphy. Garrett will always be my favorite Link Larkin from the live version. Isn't that sweet? Robert L., our dear Robert L., I was fortunate to have seen him do it at the Pantages. They should have asked him to do the Hollywood Bowl show, too. Uh, oh, well, that's Bruce. I assume that's Bruce. And uh, 
And Robert, well, this is amazing. You know, that's where I'm going to end. Oh, no. And David Levesque. Oh, my God. I love this. Guys, thank you for watching. I have loved this, too. We will see you Tuesday with Christopher Rice, author Christopher Rice. And Thursday, we will have Funny Gay Males. Um, I am Billy Masters. It has been a... Uh, an amazing show. Take care of each other. Be safe. Be kind. Wear your masks. Sanitize. Don't get sloppy because, you know, flu season's coming up. We'll see you later. Have a great weekend. Bye, guys. Oh, and don't forget, if we're here, we're live. Bye.